for our next panel. We're going to talk about recalculating routes for a new economic value. And your panel outlines for this, 5G serving the next wave of traffic growth, 5G technology and infrastructure, 5G economics and use cases, and role of SDN and business models and networks deployment. And your panelists for this discussion, we're going to have the Vice President for Technology Synergies at Esalat International, Mr. Mohammed Al Marzouki. Vice President, Global Wireless Networks Marketing and Solutions from Huawei, Dr. Mohammed Madkour. Chief Infrastructure AITC, Mr. Salim Al Belushi. Vice President and Head of Networks, Ericsson Middle East and Africa, Mr. Shafiq Trabulsi. Senior Partner for Strategy and New Markets Consulting, Nokia Bell Labs, Mr. Fawad Siddiqui. President and Chief Technology Officer, MyCom OSI, Mr. Munir Ladke. Vice President of Service Providers in the Middle East and Africa, Comscope, Mr. Femi Oshiga. Senior Vice President and General Manager, Emilia Mavinir. Please welcome Dr. Vertate Koshi. And your moderator for this, please welcome Managing Director for Middle East and Africa, MediaKind, Mr. George Debaghi. And to formally open up this panel for a keynote speech, please welcome on stage here on the floor, Mr. Fawad Siddiqui. Delighted to be here this afternoon. Um, I have to say this, uh, the afternoon session after lunch is my favorite because the insulin levels are high and the cognitive functions are reduced. So if I don't appear too coherent, I think it's Tony's fault. <laughs> but let's uh, bear with me for uh, the next 10 minutes. Um, I think it's a fascinating time as in our industry. Uh, we are at the crossroads of, of many different choices that we have to make. And, and as an industry, we are facing a few limits. The limits of value creation. We have hit the limits of value creation on the consumer side. We are hitting the limits of the physics of the network and the networking itself. And therefore, we need to rethink how we do networks and, and, and architect our networks going forward. And finally, we are also hitting the limits of operational complexity. So we should be looking at avenues of more automated solutions going forward. So as a result, I think the, the, the routes ahead of us is something that we must calculate with some intelligence and, and some really uh, deep thinking around it. Because it's not just a matter of cost and performance trade-offs. The, the navigation that we have to do on the routes that we pick going forward must sustain a, a future which allows us to emerge as the winners as, as in the industry. And that's where I think the collaboration of the ecosystem and the partners and, and different, uh, different players have to come together in, in that sense. And there have been some fascinating speeches this morning. We have looked at all the numbers. But let's try to sort of bring all that to fruition in, in this discussion in the panel. So uh, Bell Labs is the innovation arm of Nokia. We are at the helm of disruptive innovation, looking at the 10 plus year horizon, uh, and, and basically investing a lot in terms of what the future looks like, both technologically and from the economics perspective, and using that as a future back approach to advise the industry what should be the best transformation path forward. Uh, we have been around since 1925, uh, nine Oscars, a Grammy, Emmy, uh, so quite an Im impressive pedigree. And, and the gentleman that you see here is, is our uh, famous alumni, Claude Shannon, uh, also known as the father of information theory. And I think it's an interesting quote. We know the past, but we cannot control it. We control the future, but cannot know it. And it, I think it's, it's quite timely in the time that we are in at the moment, because this uncertainty ahead of us is something that we have to sort of qualify and quantify so that we make the right choices. So to reflect a little bit on this transformation ahead of us, you can look at it in a variety of different ways. But perhaps because of the panel itself and the topic of traffic, I thought perhaps we should slice it and, and look at it from the global IP traffic growth perspective. And so all, all I wanted to indicate to you is that there have been phases over the last 15 years, beginning of the internet till now, that you can sort of map the structure of bandwidth growth. So the blue curve that you've seen is the bandwidth growth that you've seen over the last 20, 25 years. But if you look in the five years time scale horizons, uh, you would see these little, it's not visible here, but you see these incremental changes that are happening. And that sort of identifies with the listings at the top 
where the internet was a way to connect things and then we sort of traversed our way into the future. But essentially, if you think about it, for the last five years, we have taken a bit of a pause from a new services standpoint. And there hasn't been a brand new service per se. We have obviously done a lot as an industry and taken everything mobile, which is in itself a thing, but we haven't had a brand new service. But that also suggests that we may enter now a period where we do do something differently. And that's the whole point of the slide, that we're saying the big transformation is connecting everything, not just people. The people is the dotted line one. And to some extent, you can argue it's uninteresting. And why do I say that? Because people will continue to do what people do, watch video and create content. It's very predictable. But the real transformation is the other part, the integrate, integrating the machine part, so that we can instrument the world in interesting ways. So in essence, what we're saying is that the big transformation will be with, driven by businesses and life in a, in a broader context, because we're going to instrument everything, rail, shipping pallets, governments, rails, infrastructure. Anything that you can imagine that not instrumented today will be connected. And that's the point of 5G. You can argue the, the, the role of 5G is to let people do what they do, but integrate the machine part in such a way that make techno-economic sense. And so therefore, if you're going to do this, there where the opportunity would come in is the collapse of the digital and the physical industry because we are connecting everything. And so there have been some interesting numbers thrown this morning. But if you look at the tail of the two industries, the digital and the physical, the physical industry has an annualized growth, productivity growth rate of the last 15 years around 0.7% and contribute to 30%, 70% of the GDP. Whereas the digital industries have been growing at an annual productivity rate of 2.7% and a 30% GDP contribution. So with that collapse and the role of the foundational enabler as 5G, I think that's where the opportunity is going to come from. And the, one of the numbers that I've seen from the uh, global, McKinsey Global Institute we have talked about an economic value in the range of 3.8 to 11 trillion in new economic values. So that's really what we need to untether at the back of 5G. So if you're going to look at this from, from a new services point of view, I think Bell Labs have been looking at the different use cases in the industry. But we sort of try to map it in, in the context of bandwidth and latency. Because one of the things that we're going to see, see is because we're going to be instrumenting our machines to get to low latencies. We have to really uh, get to extreme low latency levels, not just the bandwidth itself. And, and therefore, the future will be more about the human-machine interaction. So therefore, you have to be able to design networks that respond dynamically to human behavior. In the studies that Bell Labs have conducted, the human neurological response time, the fastest thing that we do is what we call the vertebrio-ocular reflex. That is when you move your head to stabilize the image on your retina, it's seven milliseconds and everything else we do around 80 to 100 milliseconds. So what that means is, in the future services and applications, whether it's autonomous driving, whether it's high frequency trading, you have to get to very low latencies because when you map in terms of how application consumption happens versus network consumption, you realize that application takes a lot of allowable time, leaving very little for the network to consume. So the network has to get down to very low latency levels. And the way you do it, is to try to move the intelligence close to the edges. So move away from the core networks and the core centralized function and push it in the edges. And so network is going to become very, very important. So the overall strategy is going to be this. The thing that matters most in this new era is not cloud technologies per se, not server blades. And it's not going to be devices because devices are simpler. The things that matter most is the network that connects everything because the network has to onboard a massive number of devices connect those devices to the cloud. But more interestingly, that we'll see is that the cloud is going to move to the network. And that's a little bit what virtualization is going to be about. Because of the low latency requirement that we have, is moving to the edge is not just for the, as an enabling infrastructure for new services, but also an enabling infrastructure of how you create the scale that we need. So devices moving into the network, cloud moving into the network, and the network is moved to the edge. And edges where service providers have an advantage because they have infrastructure there. So if we look at now this, this paradigm of the network become the new interesting thing that drives value, I thought it's also important to reflect a little bit around the deployment strategies and how we drive maximum value and, 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 and performance and reliability with some of this uh, future. So the analogy that I want to present to you here is you can, you can consider Airbus and Boeing as synonymous to players like Nokia. And you can think of the airlines as the telecom service providers. In the, in the scheme of 5G, 
uh, tight interworking will be the new mantra. So the highest performance and the best return on investments can only be possible when you tightly integrate systems, technologies, components, and services, and they have to work frictionlessly and effortlessly across. And so if you imagine the way Airbus and Boeing does it, they sort of pre-design, pre-integrate, and pre-validate, and then basically Lufthansa's and the likes procure that. Lufthansa's and others do not go through the hassle of buying fuselage from Beijing and the wingspan from Charlottesville, New Jersey, or what have you. So that is essentially, they're in the business of transporting lives, and that's what they do. Deliver experiences that the customer wants, and then make sure that the Airbus and Boeing deliver reliable, safe, secure networks. And that's important for you to take away because the nature of 5G will be pretty end-to-end, -end, not just core, radio, transport, IT systems. They all have to work together seamlessly, and that therefore the new mantra is the interworking of that. And I think Nokia has had this uh, great advantage now of having this end-to-end -end portfolio under their wings so that they can sort of pre design, pre-integrate, and pre-validate this so that there is cost and performance advantages when it's get delivered to the customers. So in addition, I think uh, Ballard Consulting has modeled the result of this pre-design, pre pre-integration, and pre-validation. And what we see is, depending on your starting point in the transformation journey and the markets you, you play in, there is a potential of a 30% TCO reduction a 14% enhancements in reliability and a 45% uh, improvement in time to market. And of course, there is some logic behind that, how we have modeled it, but clearly as an industry, the choices we make and the path we choose can result in some of this. So to wrap up, basically, it's three things. The new economic value we talked about is shifting from consumer to enterprise and verticals on how to tap into that. The New architecture, so moving from score to more distributed cloud architectures, moving to the edge. And then the new TCO model, which is the automated solutions that allows you to do that in a more tightly integrated fashion. So that's really, in, in, in 10 minutes, the summary of the key highlights in terms of where the economic value needs to be from the, and the architecture itself and then the deployment strategies that we have to consider. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Okay, that's why we need 5G. <laughs> First use case. Okay, well, thank you for a very uh, uh, exciting uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to start this uh, uh, discussion around 5G by asking each one of our distinguished panel um, their, their personal perspective and, and, and views about 5G. And, uh, the great majority have already started on this and went uh, quite an advanced way to in, in, in deploying or looking at this in, in, uh, in much bigger details and much more uh, scope. So we'd start with the, with, with the operators, I guess. 
uh, Mr. Belushi, you know, maybe you can give us a little bit about your experience in 5G, what it means to you, what's the outlook, what are the challenges and opportunities that you believe this bring in, and then we will go across to each individual and hear from them their perspective initially about this outlook. Please. Of course, the main challenge uh, all the industries are going through, we are required to be more productive, uh, we are required to be more innovative, we are required to be more uh, efficient in the way we do business. So th to meet these three variables, telecom in general at the core of enablement of the, all these capabilities. We are rightly positioned to create value to the ecosystem, being ourselves as, as an industry and enabling other verticals uh, and, and the capabilities of other verticals to be innovative, to do more and to be more, more efficient. The characteristic of 5G, which brings uh, ultra high speed uh, bandwidth, uh, low latency and, and uh, massive connect connectivity of devices, these three uh, parameters are expected to transform or uh, to transform the way we do our business in general. Uh, it it brings up big opportunities for all the verticals uh, to, to do more again, to be more productive and, and enable innovation. The challenge we are going through, we in telecom, we are, uh, the, the services which we offer, voice connectivity and data services, are very, very well structured from market forces. The, and, and the boundaries are very clearly defined. When I go in the morning to the office, I am very clear of my partners for the tel telco, traditional telco services. I know my partners. I am very clear of the regulatory regime, very clear reg regulatory regime for that. Customers' expectation and what, what are the services that we offer customers uh, for, for, for the, again, the connectivity, voice, and data services which we offer traditionally in telco. And we know our, the, the competitor as well, very clearly defined who, who are my competitors and how I'm competing with, the, with them, and even the challenger to our industry. The OTTs, we know them, we are clear of their impact and, and the challenges. The, the, the challenge 5G is, is opening, that the market, our market boundaries, which are clearly defined, the market five market forces, has changed, actually are changing from end-to-end -end perspective. Mm -hmm. Landscape of partners is changing, Landscape of our customers and customer expectation being 5G as a, a use case driven technology. Uh, the, the landscape of our partners, uh, of our customer and expectation is changing. Landscape of regulatory regime and the clarity of regulatory regime uh, when offering again the IoT capabilities and different use cases. It is, there is a lot of vagueness in that, from that perspective. And even the challengers. And who are, the, who are the competitors in this game? Mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the use case that are driven by 5G. Again, we talk about IoT, we talk, we talk about big data, AI, a lot of players. And, and the, all mark, five market forces are not clearly defined, which definitely brings up, brings up a lot of challenges. And my view, the only way to solve this challenge is the whole ecosystem of, the, of TIRCO, uh, uh, the, the regulatory partners, the operators, the uh, manufacturer and service providers, uh, along with the customer, we have to sit and define the end-to-end the -end perspective of the, of the, of the values, values of 5G. Security is another challenge, of course, mm -hmm. which we need to look at as, as we are more connected to this critical infrastructure. Okay, just let me just comment on, on, on your point. So you define these challenges, but what about the opportunity? I mean, you definitely see this yes. opportunity for 5G and then timeline, maybe your perspective on exactly. So from, potentially this from, be from, uh, from operator perspective and, and uh, uh, do perspective, uh, first introduction of 5G will be for ultra high speed bandwidth throughput. And for that, for us, it is a big opportunity to expand our fixed network. Okay. So 5G is mean to, uh, to reach our customer with our triple play fixed services in the beginning. Uh, second opportunity, the, uh, actually the second phase of 5G standardization and the, and the introductory will be the low latency capabilities of 5G, which is expected to bring up a new use cases, which are latency driven use cases. And that is another second phase of 5G. Mm -hmm. The third phase, which is the massive connected devices. And, the, and the, the reason I'm saying this is the, the third phase because narrowband IoT and 4G is meeting the expectation of uh, the, the IoT connectivity capabilities. So the 5G uh, capabilities for, for uh, narrowband for uh, IoT connectivities, it is expected to delay. Okay. So 2019, 
we are, we are, we are launching 5G for fixed, fixed, expanding our fixed footprint mm -hmm. and followed by use cases of latency and other, other use cases. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Merzuki, maybe you can give us more insights at, at the Salat and you've been very forthcoming in rolling 5G as well and had been leading the market. So maybe you can give us your comments on this, please. Well, uh, Salam Alaikum. Thank you, Mr. Salim, for giving uh, this uh, great introduction. I cannot add anything about why a telecom operator should go for 5G. But uh, to focus on a couple of the points, what, what, what is 5G to the telecom operators? First of all, it's the growth. Growth in the traffic where we are expecting that the traffic will be at least 10 times than mm -hmm. our existing traffic. Growth in the customer numbers and the baseline where we are expecting that number of customers will increase 100 times. Mm -hmm. Now, if we take, for example, a UE scenario where the total population is 10 million from where we are going to add, multiply this by 100. Mm -hmm. the, the new stream and the new business is coming from the IoT itself, mm -hmm. where we can connect everything to the internet. Uh, so to, to, today, total population, the world is around 7 billion. It's reaching 8 million now, uh, where it is expected within five years, the total number of uh, smart devices connected to the internet will exceed this number. So. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are talking about new population, billions of customers that can land easily in the, with, with the operators. Uh, if we are talking about uh, revenue, it's not that uh, promising. Mm -hmm. uh, we are talking about a two-digit increase in revenue expected by 5G. But the risk that if we didn't invest well in, in 5G, there is also a chance that we will lose uh, <laughs> some of our existing revenues that uh, and 5G can really uh, give us a, a safe guard to, 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 to come up with the new streams and revenues. Uh, five to 10 percent, I think it's a great and telecom uh, world where mm -hmm. there is a huge uh, challenges and uh, risk. And coming to the challenges and risk we are facing, uh, we are working closely now with the telecom authorities across the world where we exist now in Salat because we see that uh, the spectrum cost will be really uh, one of the challenges and the risk because it's expected to be very expensive on top of the license. Mm -hmm. Um, the other challenges, we think that it's, uh, we, uh, the, the 5G system is not yet a complete ecosystem. Uh, we are working kind of alone. Other stream business where smart uh, devices, uh, smart homes, uh, smart cars, uh, all these devices are not yet moving uh, as, as, as we are expecting to move. Okay. So uh, we will be ready, we think, two, three years ahead others. But I think also we start now working with uh, other service providers to provide that, that it's, everyone is delivering their service at the same time. In, in terms of uh, opportunities, uh, first of all, as I mentioned, the IoT. It's a great opportunity that we introduce now. Usually for decades, the, the operators usually they have uh, a, a consumer segment and they have the business segment. Mm -hmm. Now we have a new segment, third segment, which will be only dedicated for the, for the machines. Yeah. Uh, then the other opportunities I can see with the 5G that there is kind of cooperation going on with the governments themselves. Mm -hmm. We've seen in the GCC, and it's a small part of the world, only six countries, two of the telecom operators, two of the telecom authorities are pushing to have 5G by a certain date. And this is the first time I've noticed it, that government are pushing to have 5G, mm -hmm. which means that government would like to be part of the telecom sector and not only just an authorizing. So this is give us a, a a chance to, to expand our business. For example, today it was in the morning it was mentioned Hassan took a project which is done with the UE civil defense. And this is kind of opportunity we see that the, because the government are pushing for a new kind of business in the telecom sector, we as a telecom uh, operator will, will have these benefits to, to, to enhance our revenue industry. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna take the question a little bit now to the vendors and I'll start with Mr. Trabulsi on, on Ericsson. I've been reading the Ericsson mobility report just issued and there's quite a significant growth uh, projected on 5G with very nice, interesting use cases as well uh, and growth patterns. So from a vendor perspective, and we'll go through the distinguished vendors, can you give us some insight on, on where Ericsson is with, with 5G and what's the outlook on that, please? Thank you, George. Um, I think I'm going to take the mic in my hand. This way you can hear me. Um, well, yes, the numbers are there, but... Uh, but there needs to be a lot of work uh, before we can uh, basically say that we can get access to this additional revenue that we are foreseeing. We've done studies mainly with Arthur Doolittle on, uh, on what kind of revenue we can get in, uh, in, um, in 5G. And, and I can tell you that we are 
not there, you know, as a, as a, as a, as an industry. There's there's still a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work to do because f first things first. So the first thing that we need to basically put together and ensure that is uh, that is working properly is the uh, the frequencies. Mm -hmm. So if if you look at 5G in comparison to 4G, it's it's slightly more efficient technology mm -hmm. okay but the, what, what it brings actually to the table is is new frequencies that we can use mm -hmm. so if we don't start with the frequencies then we we basically cannot get access to 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 this revenue so those additional frequencies are going to generate basically the possibility for service providers to basically have enhanced services and so forth mm -hmm. and then so that's the first step. And uh, Mr. Al-Balushi spoke about, you know, uh, basically fixed wireless as, as one of the first applications. This is what we see. Um, uh, but to get to the, let's say, the big pot of money, we, we definitely need to work on industry digitalizations and use cases. There's no silver bullet, yeah. but a lot of trial and error has to be done with the service providers and the other industry partners. So we, we need to kind of change the way we sell and we, 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 we work with other with other industries in order to be able to somehow uh, find a business model that works mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in the digitalization of those, uh, of those other uh, industries. So that's, that's the, the first thing. So yes, potential is there, uh, but, uh, but a lot of work, a lot of work to do. Technology is there, I can tell you. There are networks that are already launched. In, in the US, you can go and buy uh, basically a 5G terminal and, and install it at home with Verizon in certain cities. Technology is there. It's a fixed wireless access, basically, application. So, and uh, technology is there. Um, you know, we're still terminals are being worked on. You know, it's we're still at the infancy. IOTs are being done with different uh, different terminal vendors and so forth. Um, but but critically, I think technology is there. It's more the business model that is uh, that is critical. The main yes, to manage. So that's my... Uh, we'll touch on infrastructure and technology in, in, in a minute, but I'll pass the question again to Dr. Madkour uh, at Huawei. And, and again, you know, what do you foresee as, as an opportunity and a challenge in 5G from, from your perspective? Great. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mohammed, and uh, I head the infrastructure technology solution marketing out of Shenzhen globally. So maybe I will answer from global perspective. Yes. I'm not really based in this region, but this is one of the most important regions for Huawei, basically. So uh, when we talk about 5G, I think we need to understand that we are writing the first page of a book that we will, be, that we will keep on writing for the next 20 years, maybe. So this is the first thing. So 5G is so big, and, uh, and uh, sometimes it's unfair to judge the readiness and the opportunities with our mind and the technologies that we have today. So to me, I think one of the main issues about 5G is that right now we're living the most exciting time for LTE. Mm -hmm. So this is the time that LTE is actually doing everything what we need, you know, in, in terms of revenue, services, even IoT, video, fixed wireless access, all of those things now are pretty much done with LTE. So even short, even latency, short latency, it is done also by, uh, by LTE. So in order to talk about 5G, we have to understand it's a function of when, where, and uh, how mature the market is. And which slice of 5G we're talking about. Mm -hmm. 5G is so big, and I cannot imagine that there is any operator, no matter big or small, that can address all of the slices of 5G from day one. So uh, I'm not gonna talk about opportunity. I think we've seen a lot of numbers, the amount of billions and trillions that will, uh, that will contribute to the economy. It's all about society, economy, and industries as well. So, Addressing the challenges of 5G. So when we talk about 5G, I think it is fair to talk about holistic connectivity. So mm -hmm. in the past, uh, 3G or 4G, we talked about connectivity in terms of the speed and in terms of the throughput and capacity because those are the applications that we have. But I think the definition of connectivity back then was not holistic. Mm -hmm. Connectivity means 
availability, affordability, accessibility, intelligence, uh, even digital literacy, even the human resources. These are all part of the connectivity. And the 5G is coming into play to address a big part of the connectivity that we were lacking, mm -hmm. which is basically bringing the intelligence and the bringing no limit in terms of connecting industries as well. So when we talk about holistic connectivity, I think we need to talk about connectivity to wherever life is on the planet Earth. Uh, it's unfair to keep on talking about 5G and there are unconnected uh, communities. And we've heard uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Hatem, the CEO of its Salat, he was talking about uh, there are communities you need to address by acute base station. Mm -hmm. And these are also part of 5G. Uh, we need, uh, these are some of the challenges, by the, by the way, acting to, to your point. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot address 5G and there are a lot of groundwork need to be done in the site as well. So the site needs to be worked at, uh, the power, energy consumption, uh, the space on the, on, the, on the tower, the transport, even the time to market to get the site into play. We can get the regulatory there as part of it. Uh, the, all of those will address overall connectivity, 5G is part of it, it will come with a lot of opportunity, mm -hmm. but we need to know where to start. Okay. Uh, we need to think back for sure. Every single operator on the planet, for us, I have not seen an operator in the last few months that I visited that is not strategizing 5G or talking about 5G. But what we advise is you have to be very uh, uh, precise in terms of what's the entry point, where to start, how big you want it to do, based on your market, and then now the investment efficiency and the ROI will make sense. But we cannot talk about 5G in a holistic fashion. And I think that's our view in Huawei, and we try to uh, uh, move or transfer this kind of thinking to all of our customers so that we can serve uh, globally the whole wide scale of uh, customer in terms of uh, market maturity. Okay, thank you. Dr. Uh, Koshi, and you're joining us from, from uh, the UK. Uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of perspective globally, but then also I'd like to know your views for the local market, for the regional market. For sure. What's your outlook for on sure. 5G? Please. Thank you, George. First of all, uh, it's really a pleasure to be in Dubai uh, here okay. again. Um, and uh, thank you for organizing such a good summit. Uh, very uh, valuable and uh, very interesting sessions this morning from which we can draw some, some learning lessons. We've been talking about these things probably last 18 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, has been questioned during today and, 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 and in the recent past is the monetization. We saw a bit of a you know, all operators, as it's not only in the Middle East, but worldwide, kind of a bit of a challenge when it comes to monetizing services. At the same time, what we heard from Dr. Esa in the morning, University of Dubai, and uh, CEO of Etisalat International, there's a massive demand for applications, opportunities, connectivity, industries, transport, and so on. What is therefore undisputable is that this industry faces a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. That dichotomy means that the demand is sky high and ever increasing while we are not able to monetize the demand. Mm -hmm. I'm not a great uh, expert in the his in, uh, development of the industry during the history, but in my recent experience, no other industries has faced the same opportunities as the same challenge. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what we're facing at the dawn of 5G. So, why I'm saying at the dawn of 5G? I used to work for Vodafone UK, responsible for 3G and 4G introduction. And at that time, it was very clear what the use cases were, although 3G took probably 10 years to deliver those use cases. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, there was a vision of UMTS that everyone knew that one day is going to happen. With 5G, the uh, application that we are talking about and the uh, revenue streams and so on are probably an order or two orders of magnitude uh, higher. So what I mean to say is that we've heard from our distinguished colleague from Metis a lot, mm -hmm. that they are thinking about 100 times more users. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that 100 times more users means in cost of selling and cost of service as we've heard from the CEO of Inwi yes. uh, this morning. Indeed. So if you have that type of growth, your business model is unsustainable mm -hmm. today. 
So where we are going and thinking for 5G, a lot of people in the industry, including operators, suppliers, and so on, are thinking in the way of the way we have done 4G, 3G, 2G, and 1G for that matter. Mm -hmm. Because all it was is just evolution of those uh, uh, technologies. As we, here we're talking about completely new concepts. Mm -hmm. So at this moment in time, the, the, the challenge for the operators in particular mm -hmm. is how to manage the architecture, how to define the new architecture that will be able to cope with this demand. Okay. The numbers I've heard, if I just finished, the numbers of the lowest number was 2.7 mm -hmm. times infrastructure needs, uh, 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 growth in infrastructure needs, mm -hmm. and the highest number I've heard was 100 times. Mm -hmm. So UBS uh, Switzerland uh, last year did uh, an analysis of 5G in uh, Manhattan area with New Jersey where the airports are, and they concluded that in comparison to what operators have today, in 4G, the number of points of presence mm -hmm. or node Bs or, or base stations yeah. would increase by 100 fold. Okay. Now, one need to question, what is that efficiency, not only in operating expenditure, not only in, in, in commercial uh, discussion and so on, but also how do you transform the architecture to enable and to cope with the ever-increasing demand, which is unquestionably going to continue. Interesting. So the, the, the highlight of your, of your speech is sustainability, literally. This is what's on your mind in terms of the, the highlight is we cannot look forward mm -hmm. the way we solve problems in the past. Interesting. Mm -hmm. We have to have a fresh open mind. Mm -hmm. There are new opportunities. We cannot go back to the old. And we need, that's why a lot of us, including me, uh, come from engineering community. Mm -hmm. And that's why innovation needs to crack in with new ideas how to solve problems. Because one thing is for sure, these guys are not going to have increased budget 10 times. Okay. The budget is going to remain yeah. relatively yeah. flat you know, while we try to solve other problems. That's my Very point. interesting perspective. Uh, I'll go to Mr. Latke, uh, and, and, and I'll start with you gentlemen. Sorry, I'll leave you to the, to the, to the last given your speech and we'll, we'll conclude the question with you. But let me go to Mr. Latke and maybe we can, we can get you, what's on your mind, you know, as, as a, you know, servicing the operators mainly as, as the opportunity and the challenge that 5G brings to your model of uh, service? I think a lot has been said on the, on the opportunity. Uh, I believe that the, to summarize it, the, the way I see it is, 5G is going to, uh, to, to uh, offer or to open um, a number of possibilities for the operators to apply new business models. Okay? And that can range from the operator that will set up a digital arm and that will, will, will start offering end-to-end -end solutions by diversifying the business, mm -hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, it's about use cases. So you can own it from end-to-end -end perspective and develop uh, you know, new, new uh, expertise a new directly route to market in areas such as security solutions, home solutions, certain smart city solutions that you can resell, for example, to local municipalities, etc. Mm -hmm. All the way to just continue providing connectivity. Yes, an improved connectivity, for sure, with a level of intelligence, but still connectivity only. Mm -hmm. And then there is the, 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 the model that I like that is in the middle, mm -hmm. that is I don't know why it's not really seriously considered by the, by the industry. And that is the operator playing the role of the guarantor of a certain digital experience. I, if I am serving BMW, to, for example, I'll give you an example. When Tesla today, and, and there are not so many Teslas here in, uh, in, in the UAE, but there are many in, in, in London, for example, right? Tesla have a contract with O2. Telefonica that I mentioned mm -hmm. before. And Tesla's uh, driving experience is based a lot on this connectivity. And it's not a driverless car yet, but it's a connected yes. car. Now, when, the, when this network outage happened, all the Tesla users lost their connectivities, right? So who is managing the user experience of that connected Tesla car? Today, it's with Tesla. Mm -hmm. I think BMW also intend to set up to manage their own, to own the digital experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the operators can leverage a lot of the assets they have, know-how, system, teams, organization, to own and manage that digital experience. So I can resell a managed service to Tesla, to BMW, and so on, say, I am going to set up a digital experience center for you. 
and I'm going to charge you a premium. I'll do the same for the companies that are going to, uh, if, if, if 5G is going to, to be the, the, you know, the transport technology, for example, for the, uh, a lot of the sensing technology in the, uh, in the energy sector or the smart grid or the optimized uh, you know, energy, then I can be the guarantor, right, as an operator of that end-to-end -end digital service. Mm -hmm. And this is not happening, and I can monetize it, right? And this is, I think, a way I would love to see, and I believe that a way that the industry can, can pursue to um, you know, uh, monetize uh, and derive more value from the, from the 5G uh, pie, I would say. But in order to do that, right, the whole uh, organization and operation has to transform. Yep. Uh, there is a massive digitalization that needs to happen as a prerequisite to really deriving this economic value from 5G and to implementing new, these new business models. And that is through the massive automation that I believe needs to happen, uh, which is, which is fu fundamental. There is the virtualization of the, of the, core, of the, of the core of the network. There is the cloudification to acquire the scalability and the agility to deliver these business models. So this is also so an opportunity that is right now, I think, a catalyst that is very interesting business catalyst for the industry to transform, but radically, yeah. to transform the culture, to digitalize, to automate, you know, a la Netflix, a la Facebook, to have, you know, to rely massively on, on artificial intelligence and then to expose the know-how the systems, the automation, the intelligence, the scale, to then go after these innovative business models that will be enabled by 5G. I think this is an interesting middle way for the, for the industry, away from just the connectivity or the other extreme end, which is I own a solution end to end, which is you know, a stretch because a telco at the end of the day cannot become you know, an expert in all the, the various you know, areas of digital economy. Indeed. Indeed, thank you. Very, very, very interesting uh, and, and very new, novel model as well for, for the operators now to be handling, uh, you know, new models of service guarantees to Teslas and, and the likes. Uh, Mr. Oshega, your perspective, please, we'll, we'll conclude with you and then we'll start on infrastructure and technology. Thank from you. Can you hear me? Sandra. Can you hear me? Can we hear you? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so our perspective is a very pragmatic one at Comscope. Um, the way we see things is if you have a lot of devices, you have low latency, you have high throughput, um, it presents a lot of opportunity. These devices are probably, the bulk of them, going to be connected wirelessly. So there's antennas and there's opportunities in the RF space, right? Um, and then all that data has got to be transported eventually over fiber to some kind of data center. And most of that data is emanating from a building, yeah. irrespective of whether it's 4G or 4G as an evolution path to 5G. Mm -hmm. So we see plenty of opportunity in that space. The complexity can be quite simple. I mean, I know the, the radios and technology itself presents a lot of interesting, well, well, I think a lot of people in this room are engineers or come from an engineering background, presents a lot of interesting challenges. But the success of 5G as we see it can be very basic. Um, it's going to be site location, size, where do you place all these sensors, all these cameras, access to a lamp post on the street, is, it, is this the municipality, how do you get permission for that, mm -hmm. and how many owners are you going to go after. So site acquisition, site access, size of the eventual device is a massive challenge. Okay. You follow that up with backhaul. All the data, if you think of street cameras, we, we, we're taking for granted that there are going to be street cameras everywhere, right? And this is a lot of data coming from every, every 100 meters, 50 meters, and inside of a building, inside of a mall. This data has to be backhauled somehow. Mm -hmm. Again, that's a challenge that we often ignore. Uh, uh, we don't think about when we talk about 5G. And finally, uh, power. Right? I mean, just powering these devices. Today, whether it be power over Ethernet or just a socket, whatever it is, tends to be a major challenge in our industry, even on a traditional cell site. Uh, um, if, you build a, a, if you want to build a Wi-Fi network in this, in this building, this hotel today, 
the cost of the power might be more than the Wi-Fi. You know? It's often something we, we ignore. So Comscope, we, we occupy ourselves a lot with those challenges. How do we make it easier? How do we make it more cost effective? How are we going to scale to the numbers we've spoken about on the panel today? Okay. So I'll, I'll move very quickly with another question, which is interesting, but maybe we, get, we take uh, you know, summarized answers on that. But what, when, in terms of technology and infrastructure, what needs to happen to enable 5G from your perspective, Mr. Fouad? Well, thanks for the question, and, and I think it's a great discussion. Just wanted to add some, some, something to this discussion as well is, while we start to think about pragmatic solutions of entering 5G, I think it's very important that we also break away from the incremental thinking a little bit, because I was uh, with parliamentarians in Australia, and I think Mr. Mizuki talked about the role of governments. Mm -hmm. And the discussion was pretty much centered around how can 5G play a foundational role in digitizing our industries, transportation, healthcare, communication, and other sectors, and some of that value that can be fed back into the economy. So the natural question is, can these industries go it themselves? Or can the service providers can play an important role in figuring out that business model? And li I like what Mr. Latke said, I think the challenge has always been that the service provider has been very comfortable playing at the macro level, building macro networks. Mm -hmm. But some of these industries are operating in hyper-local settings. And so for you to deploy hyper-local networks, there are certain stringent performance and reliability requirements. And service providers are just a little bit risk averse at the moment. But that's where the opportunity has to be unhinged. So to answer the question on infrastructure, um, again, as I mentioned in my opening, opening discussion is, it is a fundamental re-architecture of the network because you have to move things closer to the edges. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you have to design things differently. 5G is not about a new radio technology, and it's not about some new spectrum. It's an end-to-end -end thing. So we in Bell Labs and Nokia have this view, what we call the Future X network architecture. Mm -hmm. And essentially, it's different layers of architecture and end-to-end -end stitched together very frictionlessly to drive that, that resultant value. And I think if we can summarize that, essentially, it's because we're going into this programmable, resilient, secure world, you have to have this network function virtualization running in an edge cloud uh, for this low latency and high performance. Software-defined networking, stitching it all together because you will define a lot of software instances, so you have to connect it to the underlying infrastructure. And then you have deep, deep fiber into the network and very high, dense, powerful radio at the edges, and, and that's what 5G is going to be about. But around this will have to be a holistic what we call network brain, a network OS to manage and orchestrate things, because that is what's going to drive a lot of service slicing kind of services. And on top, you have the application platforms and what have you. But the interesting thing is the, 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 another application of that will be the software-defined networking, which essentially is the federation of one provider the other. So once you start to invest and build this end-to-end -end agile programmable network, there will be a different business models that will be emerging. So a global provider can host services locally, or a bunch of local service providers can get together, federate to become a virtual global provider. So the, the opportunities are, are, are tremendous in terms of how we shape up uh, this discussion. But I really want to encourage all of us in an industry to think a little bit beyond the incremental approach, because at the moment, of course, we're all racing to, to get into the market and make an announcement. But I think the opportunity is, is far bigger and far superior. And that infrastructure itself, well, the infrastructure is a service play to, to your Mr. Lapke's point earlier. That will essentially drive a lot of value for service provider. And the, uh, the way you architect this network uh, is going to be important because one thing I would also say to my service provider uh, community I work across the globe is, is the tr traditional procurement policies are also a little bit outdated. It's a sort of eroding value because in this new network, you don't procure core, transport, radio, and network. You have to think about your regions. If you want to have a multi-vendor environment, that's per perfectly fine. But maybe give one region to one vendor and one region to the other, because the tight integration, as I said, is the new mantra. And that's what's going to drive the, the real value of performance, reliability, and superior economic performance. Interesting. So it is disruptive in terms of uh, technology demand and infrastructure. Absolutely. Rather than evolution. Um, no, it is, absolutely. You have to look at it both ways. But I mean, the point is, if you, don't, if you don't navigate the discussion and gravitate people around a common vision of the future, mm -hmm. you won't get the policy, the investment funneling in. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have to think big. But at the same time, as my colleague said, make the right choices of how you, because every operator positioning will be different. 
We have some industries who will build their private networks, and we are seeing trends that's happening. Mm -hmm. But I think that's where we have to open our minds beyond enhanced mobile broadband, beyond consumer, mm -hmm. and that's where the value will be. Mr. Belushi. Actually, I agree it is, it is disruptive. It is transformational and revo revolutionary perspective in the way we design and build in the end to end infrastructure to maximize the value of 5G features. Mm -hmm. So it is not only access transformation, it is a transformation of end to end infrastructure to meet. Again, the value of 5G. Uh, network slicing is a, is, a, is a new feature expected to, to maximize the value of, uh, of 5G capabilities. And to achieve network slicing, we have to uh, cl cloudify our infrastructure. We have to have distributed cloud architecture. Uh, we have to uh, soft uh, software-defined network, uh, enable software-defined network and control the resources of the infrastructure uh, through s software definition. Uh, fiberization is a critical uh, again, uh, requirements for 5G. So it is transformational, changes the way we, de we, we, we operate, we design the network and operate the network as well, from zero touch infrastructure. So we have to transform the way we operate the, this end-to-end -end infrastructure. Okay. But it is total disruptive and total transformational uh, value from end-to-end from -end 5G implementation. Mr. Marzuki? Uh, what will change with 5G? Uh, First of all, uh, it will be a nightmare for the fixed operator. Mm -hmm. 4G was a nightmare, but 5G, I think uh, this will come up to the, the, the fixed network will come to the, its end, I believe, mm -hmm. with 5G. 5G will be able to provide a huge amount of data with uh, almost zero latency. It's a mobility service, so fixed operator need to be very careful about 5G because this will, will come up with a huge uh, impact in their business. Uh, some fixed operator, uh, they start moving from now. For example, what happened in Egypt, the uh, fixed operator telecom, they acquire uh, a mobile mm -hmm. license to, to be ready for this. Uh, second point, what will change in the operator themselves, they will start to collaborate more. For example, we start now seeing a discussion going on to enable the 5G, the mobile telecom operators are talking about mobile active sharing. Because the amount of the spectrum needed will be huge and the cost of it will be huge. So the only way to provide 5G service will be to go and share the spectrum with your competitor. Mm -hmm. uh, third thing, what will happen is that uh, for the first time and because the 5G will come up with billions of new customers, I think the telecom operator will not be able to manage this by their existing manpower. So what will come is that the artificial intelligence will come. And now we see there is a network self-optimization, network self-healing, network self-planning. And all this will enable the telecom operator to plan well their resources, their networks, and to meet their expectation from the customer. Last thing, what will happen, uh, what will happen with the 5G? I think we will see more uh, cooperation from the government to push this business. We see now there is already discussion ongoing in a couple of our operators where the government uh, are offering to fund, for example, our fiber infrastructure rollout. And they are even offering uh, kind of a spectrum for free mm -hmm. for a certain time. Uh, why is that? Because finally the government realized that uh, they cannot only generate money from the operator by the license itself because it's an end-to-end. And the more business the telecom operator are generating, the more revenue the government themselves can get. So those, this is, in general, what I see is the changes in 5G. Okay. Your views, Mr. Koshin? So um, it's, it's a very good question. Um, if I can just define why we try to do that. Mm. What do we need? We need a speed to launch new product fast. We need efficiency to optimize the investment. Mm -hmm. We also need the flexibility to change the strategy that has been going on. Right. The fundamental need, I agree with uh, Mr. Abalushi fully, is the cloudification. And yes, we can debate whether we should go to web scale architecture with PaaS immediately, mm -hmm. or perhaps we should try the virtualization. In any case, we encourage the operators to absolutely go software only, mm -hmm. because with software only, you get much more flexibility, much more agility, to launch new products and your cost of ownership uh, uh, reduces Reduce. as well. Has to be data center based mm -hmm. with common off the shelf hardware. Mm -hmm. If we had in the UK the incident that was mentioned by the colleague, if we had those in a software format, those license issues would have been sorted 
automatically pretty much like when you download an app on your smartphone. Right. So overall, very pleased to hear the strategy from uh, UAE uh, operators mm -hmm. that they are embracing this evolution or revolution indeed towards 5G to maximize the opportunities for success going forward. Okay, thank you. Dr. Matkur? Yeah, I agree with the efficiency of the investment here, mm -hmm. and I agree also with Salim about the uh, transformation and disruption in the service. Mm. But I think from the infrastructure perspective, I do not necessarily agree that, that it's a revolutionary approach, approach for the infrastructure. Of course, there are a lot of add-on that we need to add. Uh, for me, I am not aware in Huawei if there is any product or tool, no matter whether it's radio or core or transport, or even now the CPE and the devices, that is not 5G oriented. Mm -hmm. So every single department, every single product line is all working on 5G oriented products. And the reason is efficiency of the investment. Um, but there are some necessities for 5G. If we only talk about 5G as 5G NR, I think that's really, really uh, not enough look. And mm -hmm. we are shooting our business in the foot if we think that the 5G NR will do 5G. There are a lot of groundwork, as I said earlier, need to happen. Spectrum, as you mentioned, uh, site groundwork, the space, the power, the ROI, the acquisition. Um, there is a lot of work that needs to happen in the cloud and the AI. Uh, I was actually chatting with one of our uh, device uh, team members and he was saying that the new 5G device that we are working on that will be delivered uh, middle of next year, uh, it's, it's a kind of a mandate, it will be kind of a mandate that a lot of computation will happen, it will be processed in the cloud. So the concept of CloudX is not going to be a choice because the capability of the device uh, milli ampere hour if you think about all of the nice uh, capability of the phone and the CPU needed and the display and stuff like that, can be a shoe stopper and the phone maybe will burn, uh, just like what we, see, what, what we saw earlier. But, so the cloud X or working in the cloud and offloading some of the computational complexity uh, and, uh, and the power, computational power to the cloud, I think that's mandatory. So cloud and AI are a necessity to have a very effective commercialization of 5G. Mm -hmm. uh, also the uh, side ground work, the, uh, the spectrum, and also the profitable business model. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we start with the small thing, just like Fix Wireless Access, or maybe some cloud X um, uh, uh, application. And then we grow, we scale fast. Uh, so these are the things, and don't forget the tools, don't forget the operational complexity. Um, some of the issues in 5G are operational issues. They are not, for example, standalone or non-standalone. Everybody wanted to start the standalone first, but uh, if you start standalone first, how about the core? Mm -hmm. How about service interruption? Uh, how about the pooling? So there are many things that need to be added on, but uh, what, uh, what the message I think that we have is Every LTE dollar is a 5G dollar. Mm. And every step, every strategy that's taken right now, no matter whether you will put 5G in R or not, is a 5G investment. It is protected for the best business case that comes after. Thank you for your view. Mr. Trabulsi, uh, Ericsson's view on It's definitely an evolution. <laughs> uh, there's nothing uh, revolutionary about it. I agree. Mm. And, uh, and basically, the, the current infrastructure that we have on, on, on 4G is already ready in the mm -hmm. case of, of certain, mm -hmm. certain vendors. It's already ready with software upgrade. You need, it. You need the bands that you have today on, on LTE in order to make sure that your coverage is basically uh, ubiquitous, mm -hmm. especially if you go with higher bands on, uh, on, uh, on 5G. Um, so basically, it, it is an evolution. I mean, cloud native, we are already developing applications that are cloud native. There's n nothing revolutionary in, in, in that perspective. It's just the evolution of our networks, mm -hmm. yes. Some of us, uh, um, uh, some of the service providers are, let's say, already have already invested in it. Some of them have not, etc. But this is the normal, I would say, evolution of, of, of the networks that we are seeing. Yeah. And the, the importance is to basically ensure that when we, when we are going to do 5G, we, 
we get the the actual use case, mm -hmm. you know, in mind. Mm -hmm. You know, might it be fixed wireless? Um, might it be uh, um, enhanced mobile broadband or any industry digitalization? Video related, exactly. VR, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, we we need to have we need to have that in mind. We build the network for it specifically, mm -hmm. and then we 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 go forward. Mm -hmm. Whatever investment we're doing now will be reused, as mm -hmm. as I said, and also. The, the investment we are putting in 5G, we, we don't see it as being bigger than, than, uh, than it, it, we, we don't see it as being bigger than 4G. We right. don't, actually. We, uh, uh, we see that it's, it's just an evolution with specific implementation, mm -hmm. and then we see that it's, they're, they're gonna happen in order to alleviate, basically, and to help the current networks from the saturation problems that they have. So we, we will introduce these new frequencies in certain places, and then they will carry a lot of load basically on the four, from the 4G network. So th this, is how we, this is how we see it. Still for the next five years, as you will see in the mobility report, the data will be carried by 4G, by far more than 5G. Mm -hmm. uh, but for example, in 2023, we see that the data that will be carried by 5G will be basically a little bit more than the global data that we have today. So that's, uh, th I mean, that's the technology. I don't think we should be afraid of it. It's, mm -hmm. We just should go along with it. I think that's the, that's the that's uh, Closing comments on this question, please. And, before, yeah. and then I will steer one more question and then leave the floor. For the last 10 minutes, we'll leave okay, questions sure. from the floor. Uh, so your okay. comments. Mr. Quickly, in, in my view, I, I come at it from a slightly different perspective. I think if we don't think, if the industry doesn't think uh, of the 5G mm -hmm. as an enabler of a major revolution, then unfortunately we will be missing something big. Mm -hmm. I am not for the evolution because evolution will mean our industry will do like that. Mm -hmm. Do we want to do like that or do, do we want to do like that? Right. Do we have an appetite for the risk, right? There should be a certain appetite for the risk, but we should start planning this technology uh, with a way to achieve a major revolution and to change completely the culture and the business models that we have been so far you know, implementing over the last 10, 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. Because as an operator, do I want to become potentially to have the same success as a Netflix, as an Amazon? If I'm serious about it, if my board is serious about it, and if they have an appetite to the risk, for, to, to take that risk, then sh they should allow me to completely plan it in a different way. I should be able, when you plan the technology or the infrastructure or the network, you should be ready to say, at one point, I'm gonna just lift my hands and my feet and this network is going to be automatic, mm. is going to be autonomic. And I'm a network operator and I want to control this network. This is all what I've been doing for the last 20, 30 years. And all of a sudden, I'm expected to let it run automatically. I mean, today, we're working with so many operators. I can tell you, you have to, to do a lot of convincing to automate one single process. So imagine when you say it's all running autonomously. Mm -hmm. Imagine when you today you have everything in control and all of a sudden you say network as a service, open APIs. I'm going to open it as an open platform and let everyone come and, do, you know, and develop and innovate into this network. We say these things, but these imply major, major cultural change board approving it, organizational, let alone the technology and the systems that need to be put in place, you know, and, and they were. I want to introduce open source in my network. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, right now we're talking about, you know, op opening like, you, you know, you see all these open source uh, uh, programs mushrooming everywhere from, you know, the SDN will be open daylight, will be open source. Uh, all, the, all the OSS, BSS will be ONAP or, or open source MANO. I mean, if you think about all of these things, these are major revolutions compared to how we were doing things for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I think if the mindset is not there to enable, to take the risk, and to back the people running the network, the CTOs and the CIOs would be taking major risks. Mm -hmm. If they are not backed by their boards to do so, I think, yes, 5G will be an evolution, but so will the success just, you know, a relative, very relative one. You're non-linear. <laughs> I, I fully agree with Mr. Latke. I think, I think the real problem with our industry is we are unable to detach ourselves from the silos that we operate. 
we continue to talk about our products and stuff, mm -hmm. but really if, if the real uh, value has to be thought through differently and, and then work backwards, right? We all have a role to play, but I think just incremental evolutionary steps will only get you so far. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I fully concur with Mr. Latke on this. Okay. Sammy? Well, I'm in the evolutionary camp, I'm sorry. <laughs> Because the, the margins that you need to take risks that you guys are describing are not there in the industry anymore. There's no operator that's got 20% more CapEx budget overnight with the hope that he's going to have a 5x return. It's just not there in the absence of a killer app. That killer app, which I fear you struggle to describe, is something we would all love to latch on to and then take the risk. There's no CEO, no CTO that I believe is ready to open his wallet beyond the 20% mark. Mm -hmm. If it's only going to be 20%, it's evolutionary, I'm sorry. If we find that app, yeah, and we better not miss it this time, like we did to Netflix, mm -hmm. like we did to YouTube and Facebook, that, that sit on top of us, us being service providers. If we don't miss it, and I don't know what it is, if I did, I'll be a very rich man. If we don't miss it this time, that would be the driver. Mm -hmm. And until then, it's a case of harnessing, improving, optimizing, virtualizing, cloud, cloudizing, uh, uh, you, you know, the networks that we have. And hopefully, hopefully in the years to come, with, with guys like you that persist, that it must be out there, hopefully you're right, and then, and then we'll find that app that then drives that extra margin back into our industry that would enable us to take all these risks. Okay, interesting you mentioned the killer app because we will conclude with this question. Hopefully we'll, we'll hear the answer from each of you concisely on what do you think is the fuel to the demand in the interim to the demand for 5G? What's the use cases? You know? what, what is going to monetize this so that we can either go into the linear or non-linear mode of, of growth? What's your opinion? Well, I think very quickly in the interest of time, I think we all have talked about the fixed wireless, the enhanced mobile broadband, so I'm, mm -hmm. but I'm not interested. I mean, that will happen, right? Okay. With the real, it's not a killer app per se, but I think to synonymize with that thing, it's more about the business model shift. Mm -hmm. So, for example, as I mentioned, when I was in Australia, uh, the discussion was the mining companies are building networks, digitizing their mining operations to enhance the kind of uh, pit automation, they call it. So, how much how much mining they can do and produce in terms of productivity and what have you. And the discussion was, well, can Telstra put together an edge cloud where their network slice and offer that reliable service to them to sort of monetize and, and have a, a business model that if the productivity is enhanced at the end, end result, that operating profit enhancements, a portion of that could flow back into the service provider. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the killer app, it's about the digitization of these industries and being at the table up front so that you're part and parcel of their business plan. Because without you, they're moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really the opportunity for the telcos to think about how to maximize the value of 5G and not just think very incrementally about this. Thank you. I Thank agree, fixed fix wireless uh, access is uh, business as usual, is mm -hmm. an incremental business as usual for the operators. The main transformational and biggest opportunity is in the enterprise use cases. Mm -hmm. The biggest challenge in the enterprise use cases where we, we don't know where is the money, how to define the, the business model, mm -hmm. and, the, and even customers themselves, they don't understand the value. So the only solution for that, we have to collaborate, work together, and maximize the value, with the, and convince the customer of the value we are adding to them. Okay, so yet to emerge in terms of the economics of the exactly. use cases. Mr. Uh, with 5G, I can sell more data definitely, like what I did in 4G, but the telecom service is the only service in the world that gets cheaper and cheaper year by year. Mm -hmm. So. No matter what I sell more in data, still the cost will be less in the future, so the total revenue will not, that, not be that much. But it's coming also the flavor of the IoT. And I really like the IoT and the smart machines. Why is that? For three main reasons. First of all, the number of expected IoT devices and smart devices, billions. So there's a new customer, and once we have a new customer, that's mean a new revenue. Two, it's behave well once it's coming to consumption. I mean, there, you'll never find a smart device staying night watching YouTube, correct? Act like normal device users. So I will, I can really plan my capacity for the IoT in advance before even I sign the contract. And there is now a talk of, from some of the operators saying that maybe we need to have a dedicated network only for the IoT mm -hmm. to separate them from the 
uh, normal users. In parallel with the... In parallel, yes. Parallel. So that I will not impact the quality of service because okay. of the normal uh, behavior of the customers. Uh, three, the chair. They are really loyal to the operator. Mm -hmm. uh, last, last study I've seen that saying that the chair expecting the IO2 is less than 2%, which mm -hmm. is very low. So that means you have to spend less on obtaining those customers and the marketing. And this is this cost for the operator. So this is one actually, which is the IoT. Two, of course, we are talking about the big data. Still, uh, the operators are left behind in this story, in this race. But I think with the 5G, we'll be able, now we are learning from the other providers of big data, how to get more money and how to stream this once for, in, uh, for our benefits. I think we will be able to do something good in this area uh, with the 5G. Thank you. Dr. Koshi. Uh, again, I mean, I, I, I agree with, with colleagues, a lot of good talks. If you just listen to Dr. Risa this morning, not only, uh, you know, but all the, uh, all the uh, other speakers, massive opportunities <laughs> to monetize. <laughs> Privately, <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan of uh, IoT. Uh, I'm a fan of uh, private networks. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan of connected industries. The, the private health, the uh, automated health uh, was a very interesting use case as well. Mm -hmm. However, it is something which is inevitable. The demand continues increasing, and it's unsustainable with the current solutions in the market. Mm -hmm. Marvenir was the company who brought in virtualization cloudification. Mm -hmm. The first uh, op uh, operator to do that was Vodafone Germany mm -hmm. in 2013. So we are committed to software only, to avoid vendor lock-in, mm -hmm. to bring in new business models that will enable the new service of IoT, for example, with virtualized radio and open radio, yep. where the sometimes 60 to 70 percent of CAPEX is. Mm -hmm. So the question is about bringing new solutions, what customers want, mm -hmm. to enable them to increase their revenues and to manage their business. Mm -hmm. We are here, our, our approach is a bit different. We do not impose, but we actually listen what the strategy is because we know where we uh, are in the value chain and we really expect our customers to be successful. That's how we believe we'll okay. be successful. So you believe in the, uh, industrial IoT, I believe this is a common terminology that also was referred to in some I mean, uh, again, 100, times, 100 times more. We just heard from it is a lot, right. 100 times more. How are you gonna do 100 times more with the current non-scalable infrastructure that you've got? Right. You gotta go into scalable, software only, you know, web scale and things like that. Okay. So that's, that's what a lot of operators are doing like Verizon, like Telefonica Group, mm -hmm. and so on, to take this to a next level, because it's not a matter of whether uh, we continue evolving, it's a matter of survival. Yep. A lot of operators will not be here, and I'm sure some of the thought leaders like uh, those from UAE will continue, but a lot of operators around the world are risking their business and their existence by not transforming themselves, okay. because we know it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a formula for success. Thank you. Dr. Matkur, and I'm, I'm, I'm worried minute, of the time, so minute. please. So, so I believe we need to evolve to that revolutionary target. Okay. Otherwise, there is no business case. Yeah. Because there is no killer app yeah. right now. Yeah. 5G will sure. start, it's a spotty coverage. It will not be a replacement for 4G. So we will have to keep on investing naturally on 4G with the equipment and the technology that allow add-on of that 5G and R, mm. and then we will move to the right business case, as I said, for the right slice. Mm -hmm. But we cannot plan from today and invest revolution. I agree with you. We invest, we have to take the rest. But nationwide, for autonomous car, for 5G, nobody can afford that right now. So, so we need to evolve for the revolutionary target, and naturally, we need to keep on enhancing our network. We need to uh, cloud native. Uh, we need to uh, invest on fiber, and then, of course, everybody knows that the first use case is fixed wireless access, not because this is the sexiest use case. It is just because we can talk about fixed wireless access as a business case. Mm -hmm. So the industry always, they are mixing use case and business case. Mm. To me, all use cases are available today. I mean, uh, two weeks ago in MBB Forum or MBB Forum in London, we demonstrated all use cases, even autonomous car driving. Mm -hmm. But are they all business cases? No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But maybe fixed wireless access is the first one who can make uh, much sense. So let's all collaborate and evolve with the network, with the investment naturally to a very revolutionary target, including open source and including virtualization. Okay. My minute will last a minute. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the networks will evolve. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's very clear. But then I think where the revolution is, it's in the business, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so what are we gonna create or come up with when we interface with the other industries in selling them this, you know, uh, critical uh, um, connectivity? How are we gonna? How are our agreements gonna be? Mm -hmm. How are we as uh, as as an industry going to? Um, help, for example, uh, industries in mining or, or or in health, healthcare. How are we going to help them basically with 5G? Right. And how are they going to? How are re our revenues towards them going to look like? So I think clearly this is where the revolution is, and this is where the trial and error has to be put on, and a lot of the budget actually from the operators. But technologically, it's clearly an evolution. And, and that's your network slicing and the industry exactly. 4.0 is, exactly. is addressing this. Exactly. exactly. Mr. Lack. Well, uh, just to be controversial, to end also on a controversial note, uh, Bold Approaches, I'll cite one of our customers that uh, you know we've been part, and I can say because we've been part with them since their start, they, they were mentioned this morning, Reliance Geo. Here is an operator that has taken a Bold, okay, they are backed by Mukesh Ambani, one of the top you know, fortunes in the world, it's true. But here is an operator who have decided to go full 4G coverage in India, mm -hmm. right across the entire of, entirety of India. We've been their uh, supplier, to, partnered with them uh, from day one, we're managing the entire performance and some of the service assurance on their network. They have onboarded the first 100 million customers in 90 days. Mm -hmm. They've opened their network completely open architecture and they're enabling innovation. They started by offering, you know, the 4G subscription free of charge, you know, the, the, and then they, to get the people hooked, right? And then they started then monetizing some of the applications, etc. Today they are at 250 million subscribers. They completely uh, kind of uh, disrupted the, the, the telecom operator market in India. Mm -hmm. So this means that bold approaches can, you know, if there is an investor behind, right? These can, and such success stories, I'm sure, can be repeated in 5G. It doesn't need to be just like something, you know, limited. It can be. There will be a variety of cases, but I, I just want to say that the bold approaches are possible. Now, in terms of the, um, you know, the use cases or, the, or, or the, you know, what, what the, the killer app, I don't think that there is one today. First, if we allow the innovation, it will come. Mm -hmm. the, the, I cannot tell today, but I can tell you our customer Telenor in Norway, their use, flagship use cases about fish feeding, the, the, the economy of this country is also a lot dependent on the fish and the salmon, etc. And just feeding the fish is a big, big thing, right? In other countries, it will be about mining. In Africa, the GDP, you can earn few points if you, if you, if you fight drought and, and some of these, you know, key problems that they are facing with the fight. You see, this is the revolution, the magnitude of the revolution. <laughs> so there could be... So you're an advocate of build it and they will come, basically. Exactly. Okay. More or less, but and, and to say that they're not building it, they're come. Saying that there are different today use cases that we can start with, but more can come with the, with the openness. It's not just like build it and come. We have okay. defined use cases today, but in different, different ones, in different countries, in different ecosystems. But yes, the openness and the innovation will enable more, certainly. Okay. Femi, we have one minute, and then we'll open the floor to discussion. I'll do my best to bring it together. So, so I, don't, I don't disagree with the, the final comment of, and that of Fouad as well. My view is very similar to, to Shafiq's, which is, yes, we need to go up front and work with the salmon industry, with the mining industry, with the health industry, and define the use cases that will be monetized. And they may or may not use the full feature set of 5G. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, like Shafiq said, it's, it's get the business case right. What do you want to do? And here I have the underlying infrastructure that 5G provides to deliver on the need um, that us as service providers or vendors um, can, can fulfill and, and satisfies what our customers want from us, right? Okay. Thank you. I guess you, you, we all had uh, very diverse opinions. Definitely there is a diverse scope for 5G and the expectation is, is very high. So a uh, very positive note and thank you for our distinguished panel for their views. Uh, we can open the floor for a couple of questions. I think we'll, we'll have five or six minutes. 
someone would like to pose a question to the panelists, please. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Very insightful and uh, appreciated. When we look at the disruption, I'd just like to comment and ask for feedback as well with respect to either it's revolutionary or evolutionary. And what we didn't notice in the panel is the presence of this panel and thoughts on disruption through venture capital, through innovation ecosystems, through what is being invested in order to transform the industry within the ecosystem by disrupting from inside out or disruption from outside in. And this would only be done in the context, not through, with all respect to the vendors, not through Huawei and Ericsson. Disruption from outside in would only come through Silicon Valley. And within the operators in this region, I'm not aware of anybody else apart from Orange that has built a lab in Silicon Valley to look at disruption in terms of what is coming from that front. We are seeing STC, we are seeing it is a lot investing in venture capital in the region and this will manage the disruption and creation of new business models within the innovation ecosystem in the region. But apart from that, I think this is what I know, want to know from your vision. What are you doing as local operators, maybe predominantly in Middle East and Africa, when it comes to disruption that's coming from the Silicon Valley. Okay, I think your, your question is posed to the operators. Yes. Please. From, uh, so what from is being the, from, done from, from inside disruption, for disruption? From disruption, disruptions coming from outside. Uh, actually one, one area we are first collaborating with the newcomers as a of course, as Dumpy, Dumpy provider, this is our main positioning. Our main positioning. Uh, the additional value, for example, Netflix, when they started the, the, the launch in the UAE, we have partnership with Netflix and collaborated in a specific package. And same is applying with different VoIP providers and, and, and other providers. So it is about collaboration. And all industries are being disrupted, I acknowledge. Uh, telecom operator in general, we are slow in movement to transform ourselves internally to transfer we are we are we are slow in that mainly it is because we are controlled by shareholder expectation the value to the shareholder and that is controlling whole ecosystem actually whole whole chain the flexibility of movement is not as fast as agile as the disruptors in in, in these industries so the the main option we have at this stage i think is to collaborate to think with the disruptors how we can add value and build the end to end ecosystem because again, the, the other side of the, of the icon that, or the, of the coin, sorry, that we can block. So the blocking mindset and the regulation mindset to block the innovation, which is not healthy for the end-to-end -end ecosystem as well. From Etisalat perspective? Uh, this is labs. coming for sure. So if, if you are not ready for it, it will come definitely. This is, uh, for example, what happened now in UE and Saudi Arabia, this started coming from the government themselves when they set a date to launch 5G for the first time. So uh, are we ready for this? To be honest, no, no, it's not yet ready. The complete system is not yet ready, but we are trying our best to meet the targets. So uh, what does it mean? That means that you need to be ready and expecting such kind of interfering from external entities outside. The things you cannot control and you cannot expect. Uh, as Mr. Sayem said, uh, can you block it? No, I think it's a bad uh, decision. Uh, you need to collaborate and check exactly about a workaround or a convincing way of, uh, to, to, to make sure that you get them as a partner, like what we did now in UAE, where we are, where we at Salat and do as a partner now for the government to launch 5G, uh, and to make sure that the, the, the business case for the 5G will not be interrupted because of the change. Okay, one more question, I guess. We'll, this question there, please. Um, good afternoon, thank you for all your talks. Um, if we follow a little bit the strategy behind the deployments of 5G networks in, in, uh, in Europe especially, we see a lot of uh, partnerships of peers taking place. Um, if I may take the case of the car industry, because I think, <coughs> Mr. Munir, you did mention the case of BMW and the Teslas. <coughs> Sorry. In October, there was a conference about cyber uh, industrial IoT, cyber 
uh, security taking place at the Europol in The Hague. I happened to be there, and there was the head of uh, innovation uh, of BMW there. Uh, he was talking about BMW Group's view on the autonomous cars and all of that, and they said that they realized something is that if a BMW car needs to provide the full digital experience uh, to their customer, they have to interact with the Audi car and the uh, Mitsubishi car and all of that. And that's why what BMW did is that they started, they forged an uh, alliance or a partnership with all the car manufacturers in, in Europe, and they pooled the databases, resources, and so on. If you take a look at the governments, in that perspective, they started talking about corridors, European corridors, cross-border uh, agreements in order to test these autonomous cars. Uh, What's the question? Sorry to interrupt. The, the, the question, question is, uh, especially for phase two that you mentioned here in Dubai, the uh, URLLC, ultra-reliant uh, low-latency communications, mm -hmm. partnerships between the operators and the peers are a must. But we don't see that yet. We see that most of the POCs here are uh, unisided mm -hmm. and they are fixed on one, one way. My question is, are there efforts to do collaboration either between the operators or between governments or between uh, peers? Okay, yes. so I guess yeah. Mr. Trabulsi, Mr. Uh, yeah, I'll just say uh, 10 seconds. Yes, you are right, 100%, absolutely. The collaboration is needed. No. I mean, if you talk about the 5G use case, not a single operator by itself or a vendor by himself can do it profitably and effectively. For example, we have here in Middle East, last May, we kicked off an Alliance 5G ecosystem alliance, which is more than 50 partners that, uh, that are doing more like exploration, more like innovation in terms of revolutionizing the service. And that's precisely what is needed to run over an evolutionary network. So you are absolutely right. Okay, Mr. Trabulsi, I think you know all, all, all your yeah, POCs are Yeah, but I want the uh, operators to, to answer because I think yeah. they are they are the ones that need to forge this uh, this Actu alliance. Actually, in the in the UAE, we have uh, collaboration and uh, building jointly fixed infrastructure, fixed mo fixed uh, so ta fixed ta uh, project, and even in the mobile rollout. So we have collaboration where we are we acknowledge there is no use to compete and building two fiber network or building two towers next to each other. So there is a lot of collaboration in building the infrastructure uh, from, the, from the perspective of, of course, from value creation to the ecosystem at large. So, so definitely in the UAE, there are a lot of collaboration and in infrastructure perspective. But I think just, uh, just to answer, I think more needs to be done for sure, especially when it comes to the transportation itself. There are governments, I know, that they are basically appointing a two-year program under the patronage of the transportation ministers who are actually driving an industry cross-fertilization of efforts around the car manufacturers, the telecom provider, the technology provider, the OEMs and others, and they want the report to be done by 2020, specifically in this case I'm talking about Australia, but 2020 to produce an outcome on the transportation autonomous driving thing whole thing, policy, technology, and business, right? So I think if we don't cross-fertilize, I think it'll be still uh, pretty fragmented. But I think if that initiative hasn't happened in this region, I think this is definitely the time to, to, to embark on that. Thank you. I think our time is up, but if there is no more questions, we'll uh, conclude with this panel. Very exciting topic, and hopefully you'll also uh, see the gentlemen. You can discuss with them beyond this uh, for the next one or two days. Thank you, George, for hosting uh, us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.